This is part five of topic four on defects and strength in engineering materials. What I'd like to do now is turn back to our application of turbine blades and talk a little bit more about crystal structures and defects in those crystals to determine how we can improve the strength of a material for an application like a turbine jet engine. Well, it turns out that the best way to make a turbine blade for really high temperatures and very high rotational speeds is to make a single crystal turbine blade. Remember that we have to withstand both the temperature and the stress, and so in order to do that, we have to prevent dislocations from moving. Well, right now, the only way we know how to do that is to make it hard for the dislocations to travel along the slip planes. Think of the cars traveling along the highways. If I make it so that the cars can't move along the highways, then I increase the strength of the material. But what are some of the ways we could do this? Well, first of all, we could pick materials with high melting temperatures. These materials would have very high bond strengths, and that makes it hard for a dislocation to move because you have to break the bonds in order to move the dislocation. Another approach is to choose stronger materials, which is similar to the first approach, but also involves materials that have re less ability for dislocations to move. In other words, they have fewer slip systems. So think about BCC and HCP materials, which have fewer slip systems available to them compared to FCC. FCC has more ways for atoms to, for dislocations to move along and through the crystal. But the real method that we use is, is by making a single crystal with the proper orientation. So let's first look at some potential materials. First of all, we have a plot here that compares melting temperature for high temperature metals versus yield strength on the y-axis. So right away we would notice that the ideal material for a jet engine would be tungsten. It has a very high melting temperature, so it can handle the high temperatures, no problem. And it has very high strength. The problem with tungsten is it's so high a melting point and such a high temperature, how in the world are you possibly going to process it into the shape of a turbine blade? How would you liquefy tungsten, and then how do you cast it into a mold that doesn't damage the mold? Molybdenum is another choice because it has a high temperature, but it's not very strong. Another choice might be titanium, but the problem with titanium is titanium can catch on fire and react to form titanium dioxide, so that's not a good choice for a jet engine. So it turns out the ideal choice is nickel and alloys of metals based on nickel. Now what we can do with the nickel is make a single crystal blade from the pure nickel. If we want the blade to be as strong as possible, we have to define an angle between the slip plane and the applied stress. That angle is called phi. So here's the normal to the slip plane, or the direction on which, the, the plane on which the dislocation is going to travel in a certain direction. And I have the normal to that plane, and I want that normal to that plane to be as close to zero degrees as possible relative to the blade axis. The forces being applied will be applied along the blade axis. So imagine this is our single crystal, and the question is, what orientation do I want the slip plane of that crystal to be in? And again, the answer is, I want phi to be as close to zero degrees as possible. That'll make it as hard as possible for the dislocation to move. For nickel, the FC, it has an FCC crystal, which means it's very easy for dislocations to move. But if I can orient the 111 plane, that's the Miller indice 111 of that crystal, at that angle of zero degrees relative to the applied force, I can make the movement on that plane very difficult. And that's exactly what we do. Now you might ask yourself, how in the world do you get a crystal to line up so that the 111 plane is perpendicular to the slip direction? Well, the way we do that in the casting process is to use a helical pigtail coil. So here's the, a cast turbine blade right here and we pour the liquid metal down into the base of the mold and then the liquid travels up this coil into the base of the blade itself. Now if I look at that coil in close detail what I see is that I get many polycrystalline materials initially in the casting but as those crystals grow in a columnar fashion, in other words they grow straight up like columns eventually they'll run into the top of this little port and at the top, the coil only allows one crystal orientation to grow. And if I design that coil in just the right way, I can force it so that only the 111 plane perpendicular uh, 
to the loading direction a lot is allowed to grow. It's pretty sophisticated, but it works really well. Now what I'd like to do is change to a totally different application, bicycles. There are lots of different types of bicycles out there made of lots of different types of materials. And in this next section of topic four, we're going to be looking at how we choose a good bicycle material and why spikes are made out of some metals and not others. But first, let's look at bikes and what kinds of materials are used. So in the 1950s, bicycles were largely made out of steel. It's very cheap, very easy to form into the proper shape, but it's also very heavy, as you probably know, if you own, an, own a steel bicycle. Aluminum is today a much more common material. It can be cast or welded into the shape necessary, and it's very lightweight. The downside to aluminum is it's a little bit more expensive. If we need even lighter weight high performance bicycle we might go with a titanium frame. Titanium is so much stronger than aluminum we can use less material and it has a fairly low density so the bike frame overall is much lighter. But titanium is ridiculously expensive so such bike frames are usually out of the reach of your average bicyclist. And then there are the extreme versions, cast magnesium bicycles which are cast as one part and don't require any welding. Or how about a carbon fiber demonstration bike? I can't even figure out where you sit on this thing. Well, when it comes to bicycle frames, the thing we want to look at is frame strength and stiffness. Now we're going to look primarily at frame strength in this topic because we're talking about strength and defects in crystals. Well, it turns out that the primary stresses on a bike frame are here along the uh, back of the seat. If your seat is up here, this back of this region down here is where we're going to see most of the stresses acting on the, uh, the bike frame. So we need to have a strong enough material to withstand this strength, the stress. Now if strength is directly related to dislocation motion, what we have to ask ourselves is how can I make it more difficult for the dislocations to move and thereby make a stronger bicycle? Well, one answer that we learned about turbine blades is I simply orient the crystal structure so that the dislocation has a hard time moving relative to the applied stress field. Well, there's a big problem if I try to do that for bike frames. Number one, the stress fields acting on bike frames are far more complicated than they are for a simple turbine blade. So how exactly do I know where to orient the crystals to get the maximum benefit of the single crystal orientation? The other problem is, if I tried to make a single crystal as big as a bicycle frame, it would be incredibly expensive. Far too expensive for most people to buy the bike. So there must be another approach, and in fact there are several other approaches we could take. Let's take a look at those in the next part. Before we do that though, let's look at some of the materials that are out there for bike frames and compare them for their yield strength and their density. So if here's the density on the x-axis, we see that tungsten, again, is a very strong material, but it's very dense, and therefore it would not make a good bike frame. Not to mention the fact it would be difficult to make the bike frame shape. So a preferable choice is medium carbon steel, which is very strong, but also very dense. A better choice would be titanium, and better than that is aluminum, magnesium, and ultimately carbon fiber reinforced polymers, which are both strong and very low density but they're costly, which is why they're used primarily by competitive bicyclists. Now if instead I were to plot the strength of the material versus the density times price, what I see now is that my best choice is medium carbon steel. It gives me the lowest density at the cheapest possible price and still gives me a high strength. So if you're in the market for a cheap bicycle, you definitely would go with steel. But aluminum is a close second, and that's why many of you probably